God had already placed this burden on our heart to celebrate membership because it's been almost a year since that dreaded pandemic started, for us anyway. And uh, we just felt it was time to renew our mindset as far as what it takes, what it takes to be a church. Um, Because it takes way more than just trying to cue in at seven o'clock on a Wednesday night and hope that you hear the whole entire message because it might lose connection. Or if you have children, I don't know if you've ever tried to listen to a live stream with children, but it's just about impossible. My family was very thankful to have in-person teaching. I don't know about you, but when you're saying, be quiet the entire time, you really don't get a whole lot out of it. Um, And even though my son just got pulled out of the service here tonight, they do act a lot better when they're in person. But I wanted to take ourselves over to Acts chapter 12. Since I have a little bit more time tonight, I can maybe speak a little bit slower. I felt like I was going about 90 miles per hour this morning during Sunday school. And then afterwards, pastor says, hey, we're just going to give you the rest of the time, you know, after I thought I still had to give him that half. And I was like, oh, man, I could have slowed it down. Maybe somebody would have been able to digest a little bit more. But I hope God used that this morning to provide a foundation block for pastor's sermon. Um, Because there's a lot about membership that we could preach on. Um, There's so much here. But as I was thinking about the burden that God had placed on my heart, all of a sudden I was drawn to this passage. And I titled it tonight, awkward and real and you say why did you title it well you'll find out you'll understand later on i'm just going to give you a little teaser trailer there awkward and real because i think i think that's way the church can be sometimes sometimes it's a little awkward but yet we need to be real and so as we get through this you'll see what god can do god is an amazing god and as you see throughout acts You know, it might describe the works of the apostles and the disciples and the early Christians, the early church. But yet, you know, on, on full display, we have the works of God. And God stepping in in this moment when there's a a dire situation that there's opposition to Christianity, to 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 God's plan. And yet God steps in, provides a miracle and then ends up decimating the leadership at the end of the chapter. Now, we aren't going to cover the end of the chapter. We're only going to cover the first 17 verses, but I'd encourage you to go past that uh, this evening as you get home and just study that yourselves. But as we get into this, God, His glory is absolutely amazing. And when anybody tries to take God's glory, there is, there is judgment. He is a jealous God in a non-sinful way. And the fact that he does want complete glory. He wants to be God, not only in word that's in scripture, but in our actions. He wants that to be on display. And someone stepped in, took glory, and he took their life. Sometimes, sometimes judgment is swift. But at other times, judgment takes a while and we won't see it till the day when satan is dealt with okay so as we see this we see a lot about god but we also see a lot about the church in dealing with crazy situations so as we get into this into this awkward and real i trust that you can stay on track as we move forward Point number one, opposition from society. Opposition from society. We'll find that in verses 1 through 5. It says, Now about about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. One of the disciples. 
And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. You say, what is going on in this passage? Listen, there's Herod uh, Agrippa the first. Um, I believe that is his full title. He's the king. He's the leader. He is in political control over what's going on, but only because Rome has given him that political control. It is said that he actually has a lot of influence from the Romans because he grew up in Rome and he had uh, several friends in power in Rome, but yet those friends uh, didn't always have full control. So, so he needed to be a good pleaser and make sure that those that he was leading liked him. Okay? Now, if you are, if your purpose in life is to please people, you're going to have one messed up life. And he took this people pleasing to the point where he was okay with taking the lives of people who didn't do anything wrong. In order for him to keep the people happy, in order to play politics. Do you hate do you hate politics? I mean, just a sense of, do you like politics within the church? Do you like politics within um, local uh, city government? Do you like politics within sports at school? Okay, a lot of times in rural type um, counties like we have, if you have a certain name, you get, your, you get on the team, right? Has anybody noticed that? I mean, it, it just happens. If you, if you have a certain name, you get dollar scholarships. You have a certain name, Da 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 da. Okay, it, it just happens. All right, politics is going to happen no matter what. Because guess what? We're sinners. We are human beings. And do we like it? No. But it always seems to come up, doesn't it? But but as we're getting into this, he's playing politics. He wants to make a certain people happy, and in order to make that certain people happy, he's going to come against the Jews, or in the, in the Christians. In order to make the Jews happy, he's going to come against the Christians. And so, what does he do? He Kills James. Kills him. Now, did, did James steal something? Did James take another person's life? Did, 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 was he a pedophile? Was he, I mean, was he all these things that we would deem worthy of some sort of judgment from local government? He did not. You know what his problem was? He was preaching Jesus Christ. Does that seem like a worthy offense? Doesn't to me. In the sense of, I, I just don't think somebody should take somebody's life for preaching hope. But yeah, he did. In order to please these people, listen, he wanted to stretch forth his hands to vex, to cause harm, to mistreat certain of the church. So he goes off and he kills James, the brother of John. And because he saw it pleased them, he went on to take Peter, Peter, another disciple, uh, a, a big time pillar of the church. We discussed that back uh, in, in Galatians in, in the sense of he was, he was important. In the sense of he was, he was a big time teacher, leader, evangelizer. I mean, he was, he was the go-to guy as far as leadership. So why not? Why not take out the leadership? Listen, if you want to destroy something, take out the leadership. So that's exactly what he's trying to do. So since it pleased them to kill somebody, he's going to go further and take Peter. And he can't kill him yet because it's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. So he has to wait. So guess what? He puts him in jail. And he puts, him, he puts 16 soldiers. There was uh, four squads of four. I think I calculated that correctly, right, Barry? Okay. 16 soldiers that was in charge, and they would watch them in shifts. 
And so you'll find out that there's actually two, one on either side of him while he's in chains within this prison, and then there's most likely um, the other two that's outside of different uh, checkpoints, if you want to say, to make sure outside, to make sure nobody gets in, and if something happens to the guards inside, he can't get out. And so here's some heavy-duty guards in order to keep him in, so that way when they get past this feast, he can kill him. Peter's kept in prison. And what does the church do? They pray. They pray. They never stop praying. Oh, let's rally a, a, a band of misfits and let's go and let's take some people out. Let's storm the Capitol. Let's do something. Let's make it happen. No. They pray. Because they know who's bigger, who's better, who can do the job that they can. They pray. You know, we're in a day and age where things don't make a lot of sense. In fact, this day and age has continued on for quite a long time. Why do people despise Christians? Why do people despise Christians? Well, simply put, Jesus stated, they hate me, so they will hate you. That's Taylor paraphrase. They hate me, so they will hate you. When we choose to follow after Christ, somebody is going to step up, unreasonably despise you for what you preach and live out. And I think that's why it's so difficult for most Christians, professing Christians, to actually live out this lifestyle. Because people question you on a day-to-day -day basis. People question you when you're in the workplace. Well, why don't you take God's name in, in, in vain? Why don't, why don't you do that? Why, why don't, Taylor, why don't you come to the strip club with me? Taylor, um... Why do you like your wife so much? I mean, couldn't you just play around and do all these other things? Taylor, why, why, why are you so nice? Why do you never speak foul language? Those are all questions that I've been asked. You say, but by Pastor McPhillips? I mean, Kathy? Michelle? Yes, as Michelle swears at me, she wonders why. No, I'm just kidding. She doesn't do that, okay? All right, but I have worked in the workplace, okay? In my first assistant pastorate, I worked in the factory. And it was nasty. It was dirty. My wife didn't recognize me when I came home. It was rough. I worked with a bunch of felons, yes, that was the job for the felons to come to and get. Because that's the only thing that they could get. In the middle of Flint. They taught me a lot. Hey, don't wave at that lady on the corner as you go to work. Oh, I just thought she was being nice. They taught me a whole lot. And yet, you know what? It's, it's super easy for a lot of Christians, and you found a lot of professing Christians that claim that they went to church that acted the same exact way. Why? Because you get questioned constantly because you're weird. You're abnormal. You don't slander people behind their back, or at least we shouldn't, right? You don't try to steal time. On the time clock, you, you, you try to be honest, and they question that. Do you know what? When you've got joy in your life, some people don't like that. And when you compare things to China, I mean, we've got it made, don't we? I, I mean, how many Bibles do you have in your home? And we, we had the, uh, the All Church VBS a few years ago. How many, did we, how many Bibles did we bring in on that one night? It was like over 200 
for maybe one side, okay? We, we had so many Bibles, and yet there are so many, when they get the paperback version, they're in tears because it's the first Bible as an adult that they have ever had. I had a friend in college that, that was stopped when he was on a missions trip. They were handing out Bibles. He was stopped. He was taken in. He was, he was interrogated for, for over a day. I mean, they kept him up. They kept him agitated. They kept I mean, you, the things that you see in TV, that was happening in real life to my friend because he was handing out Bibles. They finally let him go. But the national... He dealt with much worse consequences. Things that are happening to Christians all over the world, and you say, man, we've got it good in the U.S. Guess what? I think, I'm not a prophet at all, but I think our day is coming. And if you haven't recognized it in this past year, you might just be closing your eyes at all times. Listen, when you have it, did you just hear about it? Um, and, and this is in a different country, I know, but Canada is very close to what we would have as far as they're probably one of the closest countries to what we, how we operate, okay? Canada just arrested a pastor for, for having his congregation meet together. In the U.S., did you watch the video of people singing outside, socially distanced, and the cops showed up and arrested them for singing outside. Churches being fined thousands of dollars every single day. Things taken away from them to try to manipulate them from congregating together. Listen, in one of the, 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 yes, it's not as bad as World War II. It's not as bad as the Civil War. But in one of the darkest days... Of, of America's history when mental and social uh, emotional problems are at a, at a rise in a major fashion. When people are turning to pornography in the middle of the night, when, when Pornhub is excited for their rise in people coming in at 2 o'clock in the morning looking at pornography, listen, listen, when, when America is going down the tubes, guess who gets in trouble? Churches for congregating because for some odd reason, COVID only shows up at church. It doesn't show up at Walmart. Oh man, I'm going to have to step back, ain't I? I don't think so. I really don't think so. Because as churches are getting fined like crazy, politicians who are fining the churches are out doing the things that they told you not to do. As they're letting out pedophiles and molesters, rapists out on the street because who knows what might happen in jail. Listen, they gave up their rights by taking away somebody else's. Why are we somehow making Christians criminals for worshiping God when we're letting out these criminals out on the street? So you're getting a little, getting a little crazy here. I think it's coming. I think it's coming to the point where religion will no longer be a freedom and the right, it'll be persecuted. Why? Because Satan is at work every single day. He knows what's at stake. Listen, opposition is real. And and, and, and James wasn't doing anything against Herod, but yet because it pleased somebody, he killed him. When it gets to the point where people, just because it pleases them to take away from other people who are doing nothing wrong, i.e. worshiping God, 
maybe that'll get some people's attention. I think it's coming. I really do think it's coming. How have you prepared yourself for that? How have you prepared your children for that? I, I just, I've really been burdened about this. I've got um, Frontline Missions. It's another missions organization that sent me a persecution report and is laying it out how Christians are being mutilated and nothing's been done, raped, tortured, killed, and nothing's been done all over, all over the world. All over the world. A missionary that they were in a connection with just was killed by um, Islamists, radical Islamists. As you look at Voice of Martyrs, I don't know if any of you get that magazine, but again, um, girls who are being taught about Jesus Christ were being taken away from their parents because that's not good teaching to be teaching your child. And they took them away without any of their necessities that they needed, with, with nothing, took them away and kept them from their parents for a, a, a really long time. All because they were teaching their children about Jesus Christ. And there are religions, including Islam, that believe that you either convert, you become a servant, slave, or you die. That is in their belief system. This is what people are dealing with all the time. So how do we deal with this? We go into verse 6. This is where God steps in. Verse 6, it says, And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So it seems impossible for him to be able to, to get past all of this. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow thee. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. Have you ever had a dream that just seemed so real? I woke up this morning and in my dream last night, I was preaching. Okay, uh, And yes, that's what pastors dream about. Our nightmares is when we show up late for when we're supposed to preach, right? Okay, and, and we're not fully clothed. That's the problem. It's scary. It is so nerve-wracking, okay? You wake up in sweats, all right? Um, but I was preaching, and, and I woke up this morning, and I'm like, it's Monday. And I think, no, it's Sunday. Let's get going. I mean, I thought that I had already completed Sunday evening service. It was already done. I mean, have you ever woken up and, and, and scared your spouse half to death because you just started interacting like a snake is trying to attack you in your sleep and you wake up? Yes, it's a nightmare. That's not a happy place, Steve. That's not a happy place, okay? Snakes are not a happy place, all right? But, but you're getting attacked by a snake and you wake up and, and then Keely, you know, she just, what are you doing? Go back to bed. What's wrong with you? I think there's a snake attacking me. All right, this is where Peter was. He thought... He thought this was a dream. Hey, this is a nice dream right before I'm supposed to die. Freedom. I'll just follow suit. I'll get up. The chains fall off. Get your sandals on. Put your garment on. Follow me. You know what? Not one soldier did anything. In fact, it doesn't even say anything about it. Let's heavily guard, let's, let's, let's put 16 guys in charge of Peter and make sure that he doesn't escape, right? Not one of them stood in opposition because our God is bigger, better, 
more awesome, more powerful than we could ever imagine. I believe we stopped at verse 10. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. Just open. That's it. And they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. The angel gone. No explanation. No buy. Just gone. And when Peter was come to himself, what just happened? He said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angels and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. And from all the expectation of the people of the Jews, they expected him to die. And in the last hour, God showed up. How many times has God showed up in your last hour? Say, I wasn't about to die, but there was a lot of whole other things that was going on that, God, I'm so thankful that you just showed up. And it wasn't my expertise or my wisdom, my knowledge, whatever it might be, my know-how, my strategy. It was God. Man, Peter could have really ran with that story and said, man, I just I knocked this guy out and I knocked him out and, and I did a swift kick to the head for this guy and, and man, I made it out of there and I just, I just rammed through that iron gate and it was like nothing. He didn't say, I, I, I. He says, God, I know of a surety God made a way when there seems to be no way. Boy, that's powerful, isn't it? God steps in. So what does Peter do? Peter makes a, st a pit stop. That's what he does. Now, would any of you make a pit stop if your life was on the line? Hey, somebody's just trying to kill me. I'm just going to hit a rest area over here. I, I think I'm a little hungry. I'm going to get a McDouble with a little bit of Mac sauce. You know? It's going to... Get some fries, get a drink, say hi to my folks. What's up? No, he doesn't, he doesn't even worry about the fact that he's going to die here. They want him dead. And in verse 12 it says, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. John Mark. Where many were gathered together praying. That's so cool. I'll get to that in just a minute. Verse 13, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, this is funny, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. Okay, so this is like a, a little servant girl comes and <laughs> when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. She didn't even open up the door. She just was so pumped that Peter was at the gate. She ran back into all the adults. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. How many times have you told a child who's excited about Jesus, You're a little nuts. A little overboard. Let's come back to reality. It says, But she constantly affirmed, that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. Must be, must be like a ghost or something, you know. Somebody, I don't know, Peter's already dead maybe. I don't know what's going on here, but Peter continued knocking. Can you imagine how he's knocking? It's probably like, just don't want to wake the dogs, you know, that's next door. So then they wake their their owners, and then the police come, right? <laughs> hey, anybody there? Open up. It's the middle of the night. He just kept knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace. Hold on. Just be quiet for a moment. He said, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James. Now James, not the one that just died, obviously, but James, the brother of Jesus, 
who is the leader of the Jerusalem church. Go tell your, go tell your pastor what's going on here. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren, and he departed and went into another place. Finally, he got out of there. Okay? Now, if, if I was fighting for my life, somebody was trying to kill me, usually I don't try to hang around. I mean, God does give that discernment. But you know what? Peter, instead of running, he, he had to tell somebody about how good God is. He had to testify of what God had done in his life. He couldn't hold on. So, so instead of going into hiding, he goes to a place where he knows believers are gathering. Do you get what I'm saying? He knows that they're gathering. He knows that they're hanging out. He knows that he can trust them. He knows that this is a co-worker in the faith. Listen, he, despite the death penalty being put on his life, decides to go hang out with the church. Because that's how much it means to him. But you know what? He knew it was happening. They had a, a, a time that they got together. It was just their, their, their routine that they got together. And they might have felt like it was just a routine getting together and praying. But yet, that was that moment where Peter felt it was a safe place to go and talk about Jesus and what he's done in his life. Tonight, a teenager might have come up to you and asked you what God has done in your life this week. What is God teaching you this week? Yes, I sent them on that mission, and I think it should be done every single week. In fact, teenager, if you're in here tonight, I give you a mission every single week. You are to find somebody different that's older than you, that's not a teenager, and ask them how God is working in their lives. You say, whoa, that's putting me on the spot. That means I have to, that, that I have to hang out with Jesus this next week. Good. And in fact, as an adult, I encourage you to go to a teenager. Whoa, putting the teenagers on the spot. I want you to go to a teenager and ask them how God is teaching them this week, how he's working in their life, how, how they are seeing God fresh in their lives this week. I want you to stop being scared of teenagers and to go and talk to them. But they dress weird. So did you back in the 70s. In the 60s and in the 50s, you wore dresses to go make supper. <laughs> I don't remember it, but it's on TV, so there you go, all right? So it just must be real. How is God working in your life this week? There's several things that I was thinking about. And if you could hold on for just a few more moments. I just want to talk about them. When Peter was alone, he knew where to go. A safe place where he could connect with people who were going to rejoice in his rejoicing. And on the opposite spectrum, who would mourn with him when he's mourning. A family that would care about him. In fact, the church already cared about him because they were already actively praying to God that he would do something. I'm not sure what they were praying for because when Peter showed up, they didn't really believe he was there. So I don't know if they were just praying that it would be a quick death. I don't know what they were praying for, okay? In your trials, in your life, sometimes you just don't think God is big enough in order to manage the big things, the impossible, or what seems to be impossible things in your life. So we pray a certain way. We don't pray out of expectancy. And when it shows up, we think, oh, really? God just moved in that way? But he knew that there would be a place where they would rejoice in his rejoicing. 
You know, when persecution hits, who will you continue to latch on to while you're on this earth? When trials hit, when things don't go well for you, when things are just, it's a tough week, as pastor stated uh, uh, this morning, in the sense of who do you call in those darkest moments when you just need an ear to listen? I mean, who are you latching on to on this earth? Peter latched on to God's people. Because hopefully God's people are giving him biblical truth to help assess his situation. But also praising him. You know what? Somebody who's not saved would have come to Peter and said, uh, you know what? Uh, you're crazy. Uh, I, get away from me. They're going to come after me next. These people, well, they were praying for him. He knew where to go. When Peter was alone, he knew this gathering was going on due to the practice of his, of his local church. Listen, listen, I hope there is never a day when somebody shows up for a church service and we're not having it. Because they were looking for hope. They were looking for community. They were looking for help. They were looking for someone just to listen to them. I hope that there isn't a, a day when they show up and we're not here. That's why it's so important for us in our routine. You know what? I had it several times happen at Dayton Center, and I imagine it'll happen here a million times. We'd have visitors show up, and, and they were invited by somebody who wasn't there that day because they just had an excuse for not to show up. So the person that they were coming to sit with wasn't there, and so awkward central, and they never came back. You think routine is messed up and it's boring? Listen, people see your routine, and when you have hope, they want to latch on to that. Oh, they should be here today. I'm going to go and sit with them. I hope I can find my family, my friends, sitting in this pew, and I won't be alone. This is where Peter was. When he showed, he found a gathering of believers, a living expression of the universal church actively engaged in laying a huge burden at God's feet. A gathering where a servant girl was just as happy about God answering prayer as the adults. You found diverse people working together as a unit. This is the church in action. Listen, I love it when kids are excited about Jesus. I love it when kids can get up on this stage and sing about the glory of our God. I love it when kids love to serve and love to, to just be. I love it when my kids love to come to church. Now, some of them probably come for the wrong reasons. Reagan for the goldfish. Ken for Troy. But you know what? He's found a family. He might not understand what salvation is yet, but listen, when there's Skittles in someone's purse, he's here. When he recognizes his tiny tots teacher and is excited about talking, you know, you know some kids are scared of other adults but yet, Ken, one time I dropped him off. He just walked in, started talking, and didn't even say bye. I, I love that. I love that. I love it when he finds comfort in a, a local gathering of believers. I love it. And my daughter, Riley, loves to come and hear about God's Word, and she's being challenged by that, and she has friends that love Jesus. And so, so when she gets asked at her public school, what changes your heart? She says, Jesus. And so her teacher now gets to see that Riley is putting down, Jesus changes her heart. I love that. You know, it's a community that comes and helps and teaches because I don't have it all together. I don't know if you knew that, but I don't. Keely is really close to being perfect, but she's still not yet. We need other people that makes it real for our children. And I hope 
I hope children make it real for some adults. Teenagers. Teenagers making it real for adults. God is active in my life. I hope our church is a gathering where kids are excited about Jesus, excited about works of God, and feel that they can share in on what God is doing. We should never shame children for sharing what God is doing in their life. Teenagers, let them have a voice of what God is doing in their life. And when they are struggling, let them have a voice so they don't try to go and find it elsewhere. Somebody's going to listen. Somebody's going to listen out there. But we want them to find it here. We want them to find hope. Some grandparents and parents are so bored in the faith that they forget that they need to be more involved, not only for their sake, but for their children and their grandchildren. Don't let your stagnant faith fail the next generation. Don't let it happen. I see the awkwardness of a local church. You say awkward. Yeah, that's the title. Awkward and real. Awkward because when Peter showed up, man, it's, it's almost like a scene in a movie where you want to show, shut it off because it's so awkward of what's going on. Have you ever been there? Okay. Um, you, you know, have you ever watched American Idol fails? I think it's absolutely hilarious. My wife hates it. Now, if you're getting mad at me because I like to watch American Idol fail, say, hey, listen, it, it helps me just kind of settle down in my life. I can laugh at somebody else while others are laughing at me, right? You watch uh, Sermon Audio after I get done and watch all my, my failures, right? And I get to watch American Idol fails, all right? So they're singing, and they are way off key, way off key. And I'm laughing, and Keely's going, shut it off! She's across the room. Shut it off. I can't stand it. It's embarrassing for her. She can't stand it. Listen, this is a moment where if it was a TV show that we were watching and Peter's outside and Rhoda's going in, hey, Peter's outside. No, no. This is awkward. It's like, ah, I don't know if I want to watch this anymore, okay? This is awkward church. You say, what are you trying to get at? Listen, because we are not a perfect church. Sometimes we pray for things and we don't expect it. Sometimes we say the wrong thing. Sometimes we, we, we mess up. Sometimes, I mean, fill in the blank. We're not a perfect people, but we serve a perfect God. And this is a perfect place for imperfect people to serve a perfect God. I love it. And so this, these are the things that are just coming out to me, and it's so important, and, and it's, it's hitting me and challenging me. Peter kept trying despite the gathering, not letting him in initially. He just kept knocking. Sometimes we give up because we don't think people are going to open up to us. Okay, but he just kept going. I need to tell you about Jesus. I need to tell you about Jesus, what God's doing in, in my life. A local gathering scheduled a prayer meeting without the pastor. To not talk about how bad the pastor's doing, but to just pray. Do you know that the church can be active without the pastor telling them to do it? Because that's exactly what they're doing. A church being hospitable, inviting other people into your home. Those who had wanted to share with those who didn't. They're being the church without their pastor telling them that they have to. Does that hit you? Peter believed God's work needed to be testified about despite the call for his execution. His faith must have been so great it didn't matter what could happen to him. He knew that he was in God's hands. This is what I had to face this past year. Because I'll tell you what, COVID freaked me out for a little while. It still does every once in a while, right? 
Should I go outside my house? Should I look at somebody? Maybe they'll get COVID if I look at them. What if I sneeze in the wrong direction? What if I, sne- if I sneeze and it's over six foot? What, what if, 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 what if we started congregating and, 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 and all of a sudden COVID just whipped through our church and decimated our church? You know, Pastor and I had to come to a conclusion that if God wants that to happen, it's going to happen. And if he wants us to keep living, we just need to have faith in him. If it's our time to die, we can hide. But the blanket we're hiding under is going to snuff our life out. Okay? I, I mean, just weird, weird illustration, but it's the truth. Listen, if it's our time, God knows that before it's supposed to happen, and we just need to have faith that we're in his hands. And that's where Peter's at. If his life is going to be taken, God, you've got this. You've got this. You've got this. You're crazy, pastor. Shouldn't flirt with death. I flirt with death every single day by getting in my truck and dealing with crazy drivers in Taylorville. Some teenagers that worry me by being behind a wheel. I'm not pointing out any names. They're, they're, they're in control of a massive killer. And I could die to that. You know what? God, you've got this. You've got this. For an illustration's sake, Um, could I have all of the children that are 12 and under come on up here? I know you're really nervous, but if you're under 12, 12 and under, I need you to come up here. Wake up real quick. Wake up, wake up. Some of you are afraid to come up. That's okay. I was just convicted about something. I know we're past time, but God puts this in my heart. When things get tough, I want to make sure that they know who to go to. I I want to make sure that they know who Jesus is. That he's bigger than my problems. He's bigger than theirs. And when things get tough, and if daddy gets taken away, I want them to know that they have a church that they can latch on to. That just hit me really hard. I want them to go beyond me and know that the church that God gave them is something big for them. It's important to them. It's worth getting up on Sunday morning instead of sleeping in. It's worth coming out on Sunday night instead of watching reality TV. It's worth it. Next generation, but they're already involved. Some of them are saved. I don't know. I don't know they're all their hearts, okay? All right? I don't have that superpower. But next generation here, they get to take the baton. They're already being given the baton and taking it on, taking it into their public schools in a place where they need to share the gospel, where they're the minority, folks. They need to know that you've got their back. They can come to you when they need help. When they've got questions that are being posed by culture, that scares them half to death. I 
I, I don't know what these kids are always working through, but man, even in this past year, some people just hate the fact that they're white. But Jesus made you that way. The things that are going on, if it, it, whatever's being posed to them, they don't, they don't believe in evolution. Guess what? You're not smart enough. They believe in, in Jesus. Man, that's a fairy tale. Listen, folks, they need to know that you have their back whenever you're teaching them the truth. And when they come and ask you questions and me questions, I need to sit and to listen and to help them get into their next step so that they feel that they belong. You can go sit down. Same thing with teenagers. Man, one of the biggest upsets of being involved with youth group is the fact that 90% of them walk away. Why? Because they felt that their church was youth group. Uh uh. And if we sit here and complain because that teenager didn't come up and walk to us and ask us how our day is, shame on us. Help them know that they're a part of a community, a part of a family. They are going to lose so much by walking away. But yeah, I'm going to go after you if you try. You get what I'm saying? This isn't just the youth pastor's job or the youth worker's job. We are a church. Celebrate membership.